Journey on the Fly family. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for another episode. Please, if you're new to the podcast, like, subscribe. If you like what you're hearing, we ask you all, actually, to go over to your favorite podcast app and leave us an honest review. Five stars helps our content get out there to a lot of other people. And we thank you for your patience in between episodes. We have a lot of good people lined up. Some are sick. Some are on the trade show route right now. And uh, we're trying to get them in here for you all. So hold on. Today, it's just you and me. We're going to talk a little bit more steelhead fishing. Let's get at it. All right, this episode, we're going to be kind of short and sweet. Today, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what do you need to go chase after steelhead? Let's talk from our hand all the way out to the tip of a rod to our terminal piece, which is our flies. Although we're not going to dedicate today about flies. We want to bring somebody else on to help that discussion with flies and kind of clear up some of that mystery that I think goes on out there when it comes to fly fishing for steelhead and the whole quote secret fly mentality that seems to be out there. It's it's actually kind of comical to me really. Uh, I mean, I would love to design a fly and have it in a catalog and be sold and become a designer of that sort. I enjoy that kind of thing, but to have a secret fly uh, is, well, it's a whole mentality that we'll discuss at another time. So let's think about, let's just start with the, the rod itself, because that's what you're holding in your hand, right? So a lot of talk out there, you will hear people say that the best go-to rod is a 10-foot, 7-weight rod. That's not necessarily wrong. My opinion on it is, is if you have a 10-foot rod, that's a guarantee, a 10 to potentially 11 foot, but somewhere between 10 and 11, not so much on the 11 foot side. And the biggest reason that I state that is at times these fish find themselves in an environment that is incredibly gin clear and they become spooky, which means you're going to have to reduce your tippet size in order to reduce your fly size. You're also going to want to reduce your tippet size, and this we'll deal with in another topic altogether someday, another um, podcast, and that is reducing your tippet size also reduces the amount of drag and therefore the sinkability of your flies increases. It, 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 without getting into all that, just take my word on it, and some of you already know that. Um, I would not say reducing your tippet size reduces the possibility of the fish seeing the tippet. I'm not a believer in that. I think that there are really three things you select a fluorocarbon tippet for. One is its durability. Two is the size uh, to, to, to produce a, a, a different sink rate. And three, if you're throwing small flies, you don't want to use big tippet, in my opinion, because they don't look natural in the drift. Try tying a size 22 insect on your fly rod setup with a size 5x or above you will find very quickly one it may not even fit through the hole uh, the eye on the hook two it's going to be if you will stiff armed and will not be able to drift naturally at all it'll be dictated the drift of the fly will be dictated exclusively in my opinion by the tippet it will not move naturally in my opinion it just doesn't seem uh, like the right way to take it out So 10 foot to 11 foot, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, I like a 10.6, a 10.10. That offers you incredible tippet protection, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about fighting those fish another time because there's some argument out there that, well, these guys that use this small tippet, it's an ego thing, and they kill all the fish because they fight the fish forever. Well, that's absolutely positively just not true. If you don't know how to handle a fish and you are using too small a tippet, increase the tippet until you learn how to handle fighting a fish. Because if you're not going to keep the fish and you are going to release it, you do want that critter to be safe on the release. So you want to fight it, net it, 
pitcher it, get it back in the water as quickly as possible. And you could do that on small tippet. You can, I promise. You just have to know what you're doing and be wise. So my ultimate recommendation as to what size of a fly rod, weight and length that you should have is really based on your understanding of casting and an honest, humble, um, how do I want to say this, an, an, an honest, humble reflection of who you are at what level you are as a fly fisher. If you're just picking a fly rod up and the first time you've ever gone out for anything and it's steelhead, to be honest, I'm going to tell you to grab an eight weight to be completely tr- honest, because fighting those fish, you become too aggressive. You snap things off. You're going to break your rod, possibly, if it's too light. You're going to fight the fish way too long if it's a five-weight rod. It's just the case. It's going to be that way because you have to know how to put that side pressure and fight those fish and get them to the net. Having a stronger weighted rod allows you a little bit more horsepower on the back end, if you will, to fight that fish, to slow it down so your buddy or you can get it to the net. And yes, I'm stressing a net. I'll talk about that in a minute because that's part of our equipment. So if you are kind of have been, you, you fish a few times a year and you think you can handle fighting those fish pretty well, then go with your seven weight. A 10 foot seven, a 10, 10, seven, something like that. I'm a fan of the Diamondback rods. There's a lot of great rods out there. Just make sure that um, here's my opinion on purchasing rods, and this is all I'll say at the moment. If you can call and talk to the engineer somehow in the manufacturing plant, that's where you want to buy your rod. If you can't, be very weary because there's a lot of rod companies out there from Amazon to Alibaba and, and in all that in between that claim one thing and just don't actually have the support behind them uh, when it comes to you know engineering um, bend boards, uh, um, um, casting engineering relationships, and actual manufacturing of the carbon and the rolling and the putting together and all that fun stuff that you can listen to a little bit on our podcast where we talk about that with Joe Goodspeed. I think it was our second or third podcast. So if you are somebody who is pretty proficient in fighting fish and you kind of understand you know, what you want to do and how you need to do it, you're confident but you also have the clout to back that confidence up, then I'm going to tell you honestly, a 10-foot-6 weight is my go-to rod. It is, and at this point in my career, it's always going to be. Um, I really like that rod, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's the 1010 Ideal Nymph from Diamondback. I, that rod is built with incredible tippet protection and forgiveness, but it's also built with an incredible amount of backbone to fight those fish. I mean, we have had large 30-inch fish bending those rods over multiple times in the season so far, and we have had not one single issue with it. And interesting enough, we rarely ever have our flies break off. That's that's an interesting fact right there. Um, we've not had any rods break, but we definitely have not had um, flies break off very rarely. If it is, it's because I fought the fish and then fought another fish, another fish, and then eventually they, they broke off. Or we break them off on purpose because we're either fighting the fish too long or we because we've snagged that fish on another part of its body other than its pie hole. So uh, those are my opinion. Can you do it on a five weight, a four weight, and a three weight? Yep, we've done it. We've, we've, we've proved that out. We can absolutely do that. Would I recommend that for anybody? No. Do some of those rods like the Diamondbacks have the backbone? Probably. But they're not built for that. And even the people that build those rods, in their all honesty, would tell you, nah, that's just too much on the fish. Because now you're underweighted severely, and you're going to be fighting those fish too long, too far. You're going to get them into other people's uh, fishing lanes for too long. And if you want to know about that, go listen to uh, two podcasts ago. I think it was when it came to we talked about um, actual navigating that type of stuff. So... What about the reel? Let's talk about the reel a little bit. So a reel is very, very, very important. Can you fight these hogs um, with the rod and the line? You can. But I'm going to tell you right now, you need a reel 
to fight these critters on, in my opinion. And you need to have a reliable sealed drag system. Okay? You also need a rod that's durable because you're going to fall. You're going to lay the thing down. You're going to toss the thing on occasion. Not that I support that, but it's going to happen. You're going to be in some pretty rough weather conditions. So you need a rod that's built from a material that is built to stand up. That at the very least, the rod, the, the reel will bend, but not shatter or not break off. Um, there are good cast reels out there. Uh, but if you're going to buy a reel, man, try to stay away from the cast reels when it comes to that environment. Because it's harsh. You're going to be in cold temperatures. You're going to be in areas where that shale, that substrate up there is slippery. So you need something durable. You definitely want a sealed system because you don't want dirt or water getting into the drag system. That doesn't mean your rod or your reel itself won't possibly freeze around the the, the rim of it because there's water on it or condensation and the temperature's low. That's different. Every reel out there will do that if you get it wet. But you don't want it getting into the drag system because that is a lot harder to deal with. And you don't want the interruption when fighting a fish that you discover all of a sudden you have dirt in your drag because it's not sealed. You also want one that has a progressive drag to it. One that doesn't just lock up right away but kind of has a bit of a give and progressively takes you into that drag system. You want one that has, in my opinion, a lot of drag that you can adjust. And what I mean by that is reels that have a little bit more of a, of a, a slightly um, salt water build to them will have what this is. You'll have more rotations in the drag reel in order to give you more adjustment to finesse it. It's not necessary, but if you have the understanding and the coin to pick something up, you're talking somewhere between 300 and 550 bucks for a reel uh, that's, that's going to do that job for you. And the best part of it is, the same reel will help you out when you want to take that same setup to go bass fish or to go stillwater fish for big lake trout or something like that. So keep that in mind. This is a dual purpose system here. I'm frugal in that sense. I don't need to have an individual rod and reel set up um, per this or per that. Although there's nothing wrong with that if you want to do that. And I, and, and I do have a reel and rod that's set up specifically for nymph fishing. So I guess I'm a bit of a hypocrite there. So, what about line? So a lot of times you'll hear people say, all you need is a white forward floating line. Well, I'm going to give you my opinion of that. You need a quality weight forward line. More importantly, there have been a lot of engineering, um, not feats, but accomplishments in the last few years and some companies like Cortland have a have a uh, uh, line built specifically for steelhead fishing because they've understood that there are some nuances and things that the fly fisher could benefit from from having a line that's built in such a way that allows them to roll cast easier that allows them to float an indicator easier and more efficiently and more effectively, one that will allow you to mend well. And there are ways, and I'm not going to pretend to be an engineer and describe it all to you. Hopefully soon we'll have that gentleman or, or, or woman on to have that discussion. But to say that there isn't anything out there better than a weight forward floating line is just a misconception. It's If you hear somebody say that, they're just ignorant or they're lying to you and trying to sell you what they have in front of you. There are better options out there, and they aren't much different price than a weight forward floating line, but they're built more for those specific scenarios. So look, look at those. Cortland has a great steelhead set uh, uh, um, line. I believe it has a, a shorter head to it. It's got a little more mass to the head because you're going to be throwing larger bugs. You're not going to be throwing dry flies for steelhead 99.999% of the time. So you want something that's going to you know, send streamers and send nymphs and things like that to where you want them. So look at something like that. Now, if you have a weight forward floating line that is either matched to the weight of your rod or is it one step up depending on what kind of rod and things that you have and the feel of all that, it'll still catch fish. I'm just talking about things that are specifically made there for that scenario that will benefit you. 
So there's the rod, there's the reel, there's the line. So connections. It depends on how much trust you put into loop connections, loop-to-loop connections. So a lot of old school guys don't like them. They don't like them because they don't trust them. I've come to grow to trust them, but it doesn't mean that I like them. Uh, I think a blood knot connection is smoother when you're stripping line in or you have a, a, a critter running or you're trying to fight that fish and get it to the net. So a lot, some of these, I think Rio, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think a lot of Rio's lines don't come with loop-to-loops. Don't hold me to that. I'd, I'd have to actually look into that. But nevertheless, you do risk when you cut a loop off opening up the core. And when you open up the core, now you open up potentially you void your warranty which if you do that, that's on you. Don't blame Rio or Cortland or whoever. That's on you. But uh, when you open it up, if you happen to open that core up, now moisture gets in there, water gets in there, and now what's supposed to float eventually will sink. I see that all the time. But you do want a quality line. I see kit lines come out, and that is uh, like uh, some of the Orvis kits and some of the Redneck kits and stuff like that, and some lower quality lines that are – made out there and again one of the rules to purchasing equipment is if you can get a hold of that company say hey can i talk to somebody in the manufacturing plant hey can i talk to the engineer and if they tell you at the very least well they're not they're, they don't usually talk to people they're busy then at least you know you're talking to a company that actually makes the line and has a feel and can walk out and touch it and all that that's important to me because other than that then just go to amazon and buy a max hatch or something just generic from Alibaba or whatever. I don't know. But at that point, you know, you want a quality line. You want to know where it's built. You want to know that it's actually engineered to do what it said to do because, uh, I mean, let's be honest. You pick up a cereal box and you read the ingredients on it and some of that stuff you don't even know what it is. And in some sense, they could put on that cereal box who and whatever they want to sell you what they want to do. And the same thing goes in the fly fishing world. I can write wait for it floating on there and claim it's a great thing. But at the end of the day, it just came from the same box of Wheaties, if you will. Um, sorry if you don't understand where I'm going with that, but I, I think you get what I'm saying. So now we're into the leader. Okay. I want to make something. I just want to help everybody here. If you are going to be throwing a fly rod with an indicator system, 90% or more of the time, Let's make this really, really simple. 15-pound, 20-pound monofilament, four or five feet of it, to a tippet ring, or, depending on the time of year, a swivel. And then run five, six, seven feet of whatever tippet you want to throw on there. Because at the end of the day, and the truth of it all is, you are not turning over a dry fly making a precise six inch on the mark cast with an indicator system anyways, let alone for steelhead. Can people do that? Yep. But the goal is, is to get the fly out there within the approximate drift line so that it sinks to the strike zone. You will be amazed at the simplicity of this leader and how it responds to your casting. You don't need a big taper in it. At all. You don't need any taper in it at all. As a matter of fact, I challenge you, build a couple leaders, take this formula that I just gave you, test them side by side. I almost guarantee you will not see a difference. Whatever you do, do not waste your money on a tapered pre-built leader. You don't need it. You just don't need it. Go buy a 200-yard spool of Maxima Chameleon in 12 or 15 pound or 14 pound. I don't care. Four or five feet, tippet ring or swivel, and then add your tippet after that. Tippet, I kind of already touched on tippet and... I don't really have anything else to add to it. I just kind of re, re, rehash that just a, just a little bit to recap it. Tip it. Let your conditions dictate your tip. Dictate your tip it. And that also means conditions means fly size. So 
If you can get away with an 8 or a 10-pound tippet, go for it. But remember, if you're throwing small flies on 10-pound tippet, it's probably going to be quite stiff-armed through the column as it drifts, and it's just not going to be natural. Don't go there with 7X tippet. Don't be a ding-dong. Somebody can probably do it if they can run on water when that fish starts to run, but I think that's silly. The smallest tippet that I typically go with, and usually it's because I'm throwing a particular kind of fly in a particular kind of environment, is 5X. But for the average person, I'm going to tell you, you know, 4X, 3X, somewhere in that vicinity is a great place to, to be and to stay. Almost exclusively because of the performance you'll get out of it of most of the flies that you're throwing. And I'm going to always go for fluorocarbon. One, that shale is is deadly on tippet, and to have something that's more abrasive resistant is is wise. Uh, without getting into it, I'll just say this again: tippet dimensions. When I when I change tippet, typically it is to increase or decrease sink rate, or to get away with it if I can because the, the water's dirtied up a little bit or something like that, just so that I know I won't break off. So. Let's talk indicators just a bit here. I'm not talking flies like I mentioned, but let me talk indicators here a bit. So I have been testing, oh, I don't know, close to half a dozen different indicators. The stick-on indicators, the thingamabobbers, the um, airlocks, the oros, uh, what else? Um, Those... (laughs) I'll call them trout magnet indicators. Most of you all know what I am. They got the little plastic cone. You slip your um, line into it, or not your line. You slip your your leader into it or your tippet into it. You squish the cone down into it, expands. It kind of holds it there. Uh, There's little football-looking things. Um, What else? And then the New Zealand strike indicators and Dorsey indicators. So I'm going to give you my one-two take on this. So... Steelhead can be skittish, so you want something that when it lands in the water, it makes as little disturbance as possibly as possible. Okay, so which means you need something that's not real dense, which eliminates right off the bat thingamabobbers, oros, and airlocks, and any other foam dense indicator. Now. Do I use those? Do I put those on clients? When the water's high or we're running deep, yep, because we can get away with it then. Conditional, right? Conditions, conditions, conditions. Now, let me say something about this, and it's going to probably get me in trouble with the manufacturers. I do not like thingamabobbers. Those things can go away and never come back again. I hate how they go on. I hate how they come off. I hate what they do to my uh, leader. I don't like airlocks because when you fish in the winter for steelhead and you can't can't move your fingers and you drop that stupid little ring nut, it's gone. The thing, the the airlocks, it's completely and utterly useless at that point. Out of all the foam stuff that I've used, I really like the Oros. I like how they go on. I like how. they they just have a brand new one that's really small. That one's that one's pretty keen. I haven't tried that one yet. That will make less of a splash, but it also won't hold up as big of flies. And sometimes we're running bigger flies when the water's darker and we need something bright, shiny, and large for those things to see it easier. I used to be the biggest fan there ever was on the New Zealand strike indicators. But this past year, I have fallen in love per se with as much as love as you can have with an indicator, right? With a Dorsey indicator. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Well, first of all, let me talk about the New Zealand, New Zealand indicators. Here's what happens. So that wool will absolutely absorb some water and start to sink. Um, It it becomes harder when the conditions are are colder because it'll actually beat up with ice and, and all that. But so will the, Dorsey indicators. Um, there are some ways around both of that, 
But here's the main reason. I think the New, the New Zealand strike indicator, if you have it, don't go throwing it away because that baby lands in the water like a feather. But here's the reason I don't like it. I'm clumsy, and the tool that they send you, one, you can't just go buy it individually as far as I know. Two, the reason you'd have to buy it, I don't know anybody would have to do that, is because you dropped it or it falls apart. I've had it fall apart on me quite a bit because it's actually only glued into the little red um, handle thing to it. It's not actually like seized or, or welded in there. So if anybody from New Zealand Strike Indicator Company hears this, work on that and you'll be onto something even a little bit better. So to need another tool to put a strike indicator on, I'll say this as my friend Josh Miller has said so eloquently in his book, eliminate variables. This is one thing you can eliminate completely and not have to deal with. Why do I like these Dorsey indicators? Well, go YouTube, search them. You'll begin to see exactly why in the five or 10 minute video, I can make 24 to 30 of those things in like 15 minutes in any size and any color I want or in a standard color that I can take a marker and create other colors out of based on conditions. And if I lose them, I don't care. They float like, uh, I don't know, whatever is funny that you could say float, right? They, they float like a turd where you don't want it floating. I mean, just, they, they stay up. And if you treat them with some of the, um, the high and dry spray, Oh my gosh, man, that's a that's an awesome deadly indicator combo right there. Super, super convenient. Squitch, squitch, spray it on there, man. You got an indicator that's gonna float darn near all day. All you need is a little bit of the polypropylene yarn, a tying bench with some uh thread and a bobkin, a pair of scissors, and what holds them on are um uh, orthodontic Rubber bands, quarter inch or three eighths in the standard to heavy duty, depending on what you like. And they are dirt easy to put on, dirt easy to take off. And they don't fly off. They don't fall off. As a matter of fact, the rubber band portion itself actually adds buoyancy to it. You can trim these babies up to size. You can make a massive if you want them to, to float, you know, to look like you got a mouse attached out there or something. I love them. They're cheap. You can make, including rubber bands, you can make, I don't know, a hundred of these things for like $15 maybe or less. I mean, it's, it's just awesome. Save money, put the money towards something else, another fly water, whatever. So that's my take on gear. Let me throw this one bonus thing out there on gear since we really were talking like fly rod selection and stuff like that. Why is a net important? I may have already touched on this, but if you're not going to keep the fish, don't beach it. Don't scrape the fish up for any unnecessary reasons. Treat it well. I'm not a tree hugger. I'm not a save the planet crazy person, but I am, I'd like to say that I'm a steward. This planet isn't mine. I didn't make it, but I'm allowed to use it, so I should take care of it, and those fish are part of it. That's how I look at it, like it or not. Having a net does a couple things. It creates friends on the stream. If you got a net and somebody else doesn't, how many times have I helped somebody land a fish because I have a net and somebody else doesn't? Mitch, are you listening? That's an inside joke. He'll get it, and anybody that knows him will too. So having a net is great because it allows you to land that fish on your own or for a friend quickly. It keeps you from fighting that fish for a very long time. What kind of net do you want? Well, for those fish, because they're always going to be pulling at you, something with an extended handle, bigger than a normal net. <laughs> I've, I've actually seen people, and God bless them, like I get it. Not having the right equipment, just it sucks. Um, I've had my own nets that the fish don't even fit in. They flop right out of it, or I can't scoop them up in it. And it's, it's, it stinks. If you got it, take it, but at least take a net. Here's the most important thing. If you are not going to keep that fish, 
that material, that net basket needs to either be rubber or rubber coated. If it is not and you don't want to keep those fish, throw it in the fire because it will scrape off their slime and it will ultimately kill that fish. We know that because if you go on YouTube and search the Arctic char that they did this with, with a glove, it killed the fish because it scrapes off a protective coating on them. It would be like kind of a, a, um, if you, if, if, if you would relate it to a human, it'd be like scraping the flora a little bit at a time out of your gut. So, do what's necessary, have the right equipment, a bigger basket, a wider net is going to be the best with a longer handle. It just is. You don't need all that, but you do need something to protect the fish if you're going to bring a net. It's just the fact of the matter. And even if we're not sure if it kills a fish, let me give you a little illustration why why I think this is important. So if I'm driving down the road and I see what looks to be somebody's raincoat in the middle of the road, and it's raining out, it's a little foggy, but it could be a person still in the coat. Do I drive over the coat, throw caution to the wind, or do I pull over the road to check to see if there's a person in there? Well, I hope you answered with answer B, pull over, way on the side of caution. Now, clearly, I'm not talking about persons here. I'm talking about a fish. It's an extreme analogy to make a simple point. Even if you're not sure I'm right that it kills a fish, way on the side of caution and use something that we know won't. I think that's pretty simple. I think it's a good thing to live by in many respects. Anyways, so that's kind of it. That's my take on what should you have for steelhead fishing. Now, Streamer fishing and nymph fishing, you can do a lot of that with the same equipment. If you're going to be throwing big articulated streamers and you're going to be fishing from the the shore, from the mouths, or at the mouths, excuse me, you might want to stick with an eight weight. You might want to stick with something that has a stiffer, that doesn't have a soft tip on it for sure, that hopefully will allow you to cast and huck those bigger streamers. But in my opinion, that also requires a different line, a better line built for streamers, maybe a bass line or something that's designed with that uh, bigger, fatter taper at the end to turn over those bigger insects and to get them out where you want. So, friends, I appreciate you joining me. I'm so glad that you joined me. I hope this helps. I hope this gets you excited about fly fishing i hope even though season's kind of starting to wrap up a little bit i mean we're we got a couple month and a half coming up through here that we can get out and wet some lines for some steelhead and be doing that but be safe while you do it find us on your platforms subscribe to this please and share it with your friends and leave us some reviews five stars if you think it's worth it because that helps us get our content out there Until the next time, friends, keep your lines wet, your flies in the fish's mouth, and God bless.